Welcome to the Wounds of the Faithful podcast, brought to you by DSW Ministries. Your host is singer, songwriter, speaker, and domestic violence advocate, Diana Winkler. She is passionate about helping survivors in the church heal from domestic violence and abuse and trauma. This podcast is not a substitute for professional counseling or qualified medical help. Now, here is Diana. Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome back. It's a new year. You made it. Well, I have a great guest for you today. I told you about him um, last week with the video clip and audio clip. And um, he's here today, Pastor Mark Sowersby, and he has knocked this interview out of the park, and we had an amazing time. We did not have an amazing time with the Zoom platform. Uh, I could not hear him, but he could hear me, and it was a half an hour of back and forth trying to get it to work, so I wound up having to record this episode um, on our phones with the earbuds, so... (laughs) I don't normally do that. I usually have my <laughs> my three hundred dollar studio microphone. So if it doesn't sound as good, I apologize. But this content is so great that I think you'll forgive me. <laughs> but I'll try to do some uh, post production uh, to make it sound better. So without further ado, here is Pastor Mark. Yeah. Nice, nice to meet you. <laughs> yes, nice to meet you also. And I saw your wife there too. So, and I think you saw my husband's beard anyway. <laughs> yes, yes. And my wife is the, the strength and the brains of this operation around me. <laughs> I am blessed. I am a blessed man. Is. Amen. Thank you. Thank Amen. you so much. Yes. So we got the um, the technical technical uh, demons out of the way. I don't usually record podcasts on my phone, but hey, it's better than not having the recording at all. Um, well, I appreciate that. I we tried two <laughs> computers and my and my Apple phone, and I have to tell you, I am a I am a novice at computers at best. So yeah, me too. So that's my husband's a techie, and um, so anytime. Anything goes wrong, and I'm flipping out, then I go and call him. <laughs> so, we are kindred spirits for sure. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And I read your testimony about your website and your face and your, your podcast and everything. What a beautiful testimony you have. Oh, thank testimony. you so much. So you, you're in Arizona, is that correct? Yes. Well, I'm in Phoenix. I, wow. Well, I have to tell you, one of my bucket lists, because I'm a... I'm a Northeast guy. I'm a yeah. New England, New York. We have snow. It's freezing. We're gonna. They're saying we could have a possible blizzard tomorrow. Uh, but I we're heard that. Go to the Grand Canyon. That's my on my bucket list. My my yes. family hear me speak about that all the time. I've never seen it, uh, but I long to. Well, let me tell you, it's it's more breathtaking than you can imagine. The pictures. Don't do it justice. I've been there many, many times, of course. And uh, yes, you should come. As soon as you're allowed to travel, I would I would be over here. Yeah, There's so much more to see. We long to go. We really want to see it. You know, somebody said you really see the significance when you look at that great canyon and you see how small you are. It humbles you and reminds you of what a great big God we serve. So, you know, we just... Amen. Uh, so, and thank we, you for um, hearing my story and my testimony. And it's an honor to be here with you and, uh, you know, celebrate the victories that we have in Christ. Amen, brother. So um, we're going to get to know you a bit here for sure. my listeners. So why don't you tell the uh, listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Mark Sowersby. I'm a husband, a father, a friend. I'm a sports fan. I eat too much. I talk too much, but I'm a pastor and a servant of Jesus Christ. 
Amen. I was looking at all your pictures and stuff, and I saw the your progression of your your weight loss. That is so amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And my weight loss journey is really just a symptom or result of the greater healing that's taking place in my life. Uh, I'm very proud of it. It's something I have to work hard for and be very disciplined in. So yes, there's a there's a work towards it, but really it's the sub to the main plot. The main plot is what Jesus did in my heart to help me forgive and help me heal the abuses and the pains. And as that began to fill my life, this weight loss journey with the discipline and that learning good habits and exercising and I'm up to running uh, six miles a day on the treadmill. So Wow, six yeah. miles. Yeah. So. Well, remember, we're not in Arizona heat, so it's not hot, you know. <laughs> Well, I have a treadmill. That's usually what I exercise on, and I have I have a, an exercise room. But I don't run unless somebody's chasing me or the laxative has started working. There you go. <laughs> hey, those are good reasons to run. Are, so you know what? So it's that's, my exercise so is usually martial arts. That's that's normally what I do for my exercise. So my, my son <laughs> is just my son is almost a black belt in Taekwondo. Is that correct, oh, God guys? Tongue pseudo. I'm sorry. Tongue pseudo. Tongue pseudo. There's a difference. <laughs> there is. Um, and uh, we started when we were originally, well, we're originally, we lived in Ohio for a season. And I pastored a church in Ohio. And my son started with Taekwondo. But when we came to upstate New York, there was only a Tongue pseudo studio that we could find that would work with us in our budget. You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, so so he switched his discipline, and next week he'll be going for the the one belt just below black. I think it's blue in his discipline. Blue. It may be brown. Blue. In, I think in, it's brown. I think he told me it's blue, but I I just write the check. That's all I know. Well, I, congratulations. That's that's great. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about your childhood. Um, let's start at the beginning. So what was your childhood like? Well, I, unfortunately, I have a story of brokenness, pain, and sorrow. I was born from an affair. Uh, so my father never really had a relationship with him. I am assuming that as soon as he uh, got the news, he, he left. So I was hmm. raised by my mom. I have two siblings that my mom had from a prior marriage. So the three of us kind of lived together at my grandmother's house. And that's what I knew. That was what life was. About seven years old, a young man came into our family. And that young man uh, eventually married my mom, 20 years her younger. And when he came into our home, he brought abuse and pain. He brought death and destruction. He brought lies and poison. And as any abuser, those abusers have touched many people. And as not only did he abuse my mom in a... In, with just vulgarness and pain, but he also abused me and with sexual abuse and physical abuse and emotional abuse. And it was just a very difficult time in my life. So from seven to 14, that's kind of the world I knew. Not only did he abuse my body, not only did he steal from me my dignity, my, my value, not only did he try to control me, but he also sold me for other men to abuse me, mm. other men to take, take my body. He stabbed me and beat me and burnt me. And at 16 oh years old, I was invited to church. I ran into a youth group, and uh, there's a whole story in that. But let me tell you, I ran into youth group, and I ran into Jesus. Jesus with amen. His loving, amen. With Jesus' loving arms, he wrapped them around me and started me on the journey, journey of forgiveness. And it's been a journey. Of, I just turned 50. We just lost my mom uh, earlier this year. <laughs> They say a flu, wow. some say COVID, some say just a flu, uh, but we lost her earlier this year, and it was really kind of a season for me to walk through some even deeper, deeper healing. Well, we're, we're, we have a lot in common because I just lost my brother this week. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry yeah, for your so loss. We, we both have losses today. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss. Yes, well... Well, thank and you. And your, your mother was a believer? She was at the end of her life. She, uh, you know, as we say, 
the eleventh hour thief on the cross. Remember me? Mm -hmm. My mom did have one of those kind of conversions. Uh, unfortunately, she never. The last few years of her life, she came to understand Jesus, but she never forgave herself or forgave her pain. She lived with the regrets and the shames and the guilt of her pains. She knew the love of Christ. And I believe that when she closed her eyes on this earth, she opened her eyes there because of what Christ did for her. But she carried this burden of shame and guilt and hurt. But I forgave her, not because I'm special, not because I'm better. I forgave her because Christ forgave me. And in that journey of learning what to forgive, people say to me, how could you forgive such a great thing? I just forgave what was in front of me. That's it. Step by step, precept by precept. Um, that's how I forgave. It was a little bit at a time. I, you know, I couldn't think about the whole journey all at once. It was too big. It was too hard. But God just said, forgive what's in front of you. So I forgive this day, <laughs> this day. Well, um, we'll definitely get into um, the, your process of forgiveness. Um, would it be okay to, to uh, circle back to your stepfather coming into your life? Um, now, it sounded like it was a very violent the way he treated you. Was, was it, it was. like a, um, did he do any grooming of you to start I, the abuse or was it violent right away? I believe there was grooming, again, being so young and um, being so uh, uh, naive. I probably didn't recognize it, but I'm sure there was grooming. Uh, you know, there was there was this natural longing from a child without a father to find a father figure. Um, mm -hmm. Being so young, not understanding the process of that, and any any person that would give me attention, I would run to them to try to find somebody who would govern me or lead me or guide me or accept me. So I'm sure there was some manipulation uh, in that, and as as I became more groomed or broken or, or uh, became more pliable, if you would, because of my young immaturity, uh, he began to have more of his way on it. Just so you know, and I always refer to him as my mother's husband, never as my stepfather. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, 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 you didn't offend. No, I, I just, <laughs> you, know, I, it's, you know, I have forgiven him. I think in forgiveness, it's okay to have... Uh, some boundaries, I sure. think that, you know, and so, so, so to have some healthy boundaries, I've forgiven him, I've put him in the hands of God, and I pray the grace of God will meet him in his pain and in his sorrow, and, and only God can reach him, uh, but again, there's some healthy boundaries around my life and my family's. So what was your relationship with God when you were going through all this abuse? You know, we grew up in a very religious home, uh, New England, I was a New England Protestant. So most of New mm -hmm. England are Catholic, uh, Irish Catholic, Italian Catholic, Polish Catholic, French Catholic. But I was the rare Protestant. <laughs> and, and I remember saying to my grandfather one day, I asked him, I said, um, I, I, well, let me back up and say, I always knew what I wasn't. I knew I wasn't a Catholic, but I didn't know what I was. So grandpa used to tell us we weren't Catholic. He announced that pretty clearly. But one day I asked him, I said, then if we're not Catholic, what religion are we? And all he said was, go ask your mother. So, you know, we didn't really <laughs> grow up in any kind of formal uh, faith-based community. Uh, you know, sometimes went to Christmas Eve service. You know, those kind of what we call CEers, Easter and Christmas. The CNA, the CNA yeah, crowd. Right. That's right. But it really wasn't a church was not a part of my life, not a part of my, you know, we knew God was there, be good and you go to heaven, you know, be nice to people, you go to heaven. But there really wasn't a faith based, um, faith based situation. I'll be honest with you. Uh, the only religion I got or the only faith I got was the one album that was played in our home. It's not a Christian album. It was Jesus Christ Superstar. I'm a kid of the oh. 70s. Yes, but, I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, but God's name is so powerful. Now as a as a Bible college graduate, as a pastor, I could see all the holes of the, the theology in that and how it was really, sure. really dragged down the gospel. But you know, they say Jesus Christ. And as a child, right. that name is so powerful. 
So, I mean, I didn't know anything. So here I was. I, I remember seven years old with a big headset on, sitting in front of the speakers and, and listening to Jesus Christ. Superstar. And, and, and now I realize what a mockery it was. But then right. just the name has power. Yeah, there was there was no resurrection in that movie. That no, was, no, no. There's it's, yeah. it's a complete mark. You know when you have Mary Magdalene sing to to him and say, "You're just a man, only a man." I mean, it's such a mockery. But again, at eight years old, ten years old, I thank God that all truth belongs to God, and His name is so Amen. powerful that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And as that name Jesus was spoken, it pierced my darkness. Now, I didn't know about crying out. I didn't know about prayer. But God was preparing me for such a time. And at 16, uh, the lifeguard at the apartment complex invited me to church. She was a pretty girl, and I didn't want to say no. Uh, she, invited, <laughs> she, she invited me and picked me up with her boyfriend. Uh, we, Oops. We went to, yeah. <laughs> I went to church that night, and, and there began my journey into meeting Christ, knowing his mercy and grace, into uh, my faith walk, and it's been a journey ever since. So is that when you, um, when you met the Lord for, for real and got saved? Or Exactly. Yep, that I was 16 later? years old. It was the early part of the summer, and I went to that youth group, and everybody told me to to throw away my rock and roll music and to cut my hair and take my earring out. And everybody wanted to hug me and I didn't want to be hugged by anybody. It's an evangelical Pentecostal church. And I was like, I don't know. Yeah, but come to find out the youth pastor lived in the same apartment complex I did. And he, I had to ride to church anytime it was open. So uh, later on that, that summer, mid August, I remember a man inviting me, a, a young man from the youth group, it was raining. He was giving me a ride home. We got into his car, and he asked me right there, uh, Mark, do you want to ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? And we prayed right there, a sinner's prayer, uh, and I recognized the grace of God and the mercy of God and the Spirit of God. And at 16 years old, I asked Jesus Christ to be my Lord, and I thank him that he was calling me at such a time. So, and then I had to grow up. Wow. And then I had to grow. I was still 16 with a messed up background and, a, yeah. and still had a, still was spilling life all over myself. But that church loved me. Yeah. They hugged me and kicked me in the can at the same time. So <laughs> that, that was okay. That sounds good. Now, were you out of your mom's house? Um, I, I away from not. your abuser? I, well, when the abuse first became, and I don't want to say public, but when it became outside of the family, when I meant uh, the first person I confessed it to or, or shared it with was my uncle. And I think that people have to remember, my abuse happened from 1977 to 1984. And the awareness and the advocacy that's out there today wasn't there then. And things like this happened behind closed doors and I think culturally, not everybody, but culturally and most families said, we keep that stuff behind closed doors. We don't share it. We, we handle mm -hmm. it as families. Uh, I told my uncle at 14 years old, uh, that was the first person I confessed to. And I ended up living with my uncle for about a year. He became my defender. Uh, oh, he he protected me. So from about 14 to about 15 and a half, I lived with my uncle. In about 15 and a half, I moved back with my mom. Uh, and yes, her husband was still there. Mm. But he, uh, he was wow. very sickly at this time with uh, MS. So uh, his, mm -hmm. he wasn't able to hurt me physically anymore. And I was strong enough to not allow anybody to hurt me anymore. So... Now you said the word confess. Well, you didn't do anything wrong, so yeah, that thank you. I, yeah, I, I just meant I, I told, you shared, I shared. Yeah, That's you a better shared word. Your yeah. story, your abuse, uh, your victimization. So yeah, yes. you don't yeah. have to apologize yes, I, for I, anything. Amen. Or confess amen. anything. Amen. Thank you. That's right. It was probably a poor choice of words. I was just meeting, <laughs> I, I announced to my uncle, or I, I shared. I, I took it out. I took it out of that simple family unit that I would tell my mom 
my mom having so much hurt and pain in her life didn't know how to handle that uh, and just would say, well, he promises not to do it again. And he promised not to do it. And of course, you know, so in a lot of ways, I felt like my mom was a victim. Uh, and, and, and even though I've had to learn to forgive my mom because of what she allowed to happen, but in some ways, not that I justify it, but I've begun to understand it uh, because she was abused in her, she was abused by her first husband who, Mm. broke her heart because uh, just pain, who had many affairs on her. And she was so broken down, so hurting. Uh, and she did not understand love. I think she um, interpreted love in a very, uh, I'm trying to think of the word here, um, uh, you know, an enabling way. My mom was more of an enabler. And I think she interpreted her love in enabling. So she enabled people. I mean, it sounds like codependency. Was that the word you're looking for? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So you you struggled with your weight for years. Was that a symptom of your your abuse in your childhood? I believe it was. So? I th I think it was. You know, I'm I'm not a psychologist or or a, a social worker. I'm I'm a I'm a preacher. But you know, I think what I was trying to find in food was comfort, friendship. Uh, it always accepted me. You know, uh, it comforted me when I was uh, having a bad day and it rewarded me when I was having a good one. But like any drug, if you would, it lies to you. And it, it says, hey, it's, everything will be okay. Just have a little bit more. Have a little bit more. And, you know, it just is. It, so for me, food became my drug of choice. Mm -hmm. uh, it became where I found comfort, found peace, found acceptance. I punished myself with it. Boy, I'm no good. I'm going to eat ice cream. Oh, I'm having a great day. I'm going to eat ice cream. So, you know, oh. it was one of those things. Uh, what I tell people is that I wish I could say to you that, that God has taken away all the hurt, all the pain, all the sorrow. It's still there in my life. It's, it's still a familiar, familiar pain that continues to call to me. But what God did is he became bigger. He became bigger than the pain. He became bigger than the shame. He became bigger than the hurt. So is it still there? Sure. And the flesh wants to run to it. And, and the psyche wants to run to it because I know it. It's, it's comfortable. I, I know my role there. I, I, I understand what my protection and my manipulation that I can find there. But God became bigger. God became bigger. You know, I was telling a friend today. And I climbed a mountain. After I lost about 50 pounds, I climbed a mountain. And it was about a half a mile long. And to me, it was Everest. It was the biggest mountain in the world. And it took me hours to go up. And I had blisters on my feet, bruises on my toe. I was very proud that I climbed it. But after I lost about 100 pounds, I climbed the biggest mountain in the state of New York called Mount Marcy. And what was the difference between those two mountains? One was bigger. And... And I think that's the same thing what happened to me is that even though that sometimes the enemy wants to try to bring me back to those familiar pains, those familiar insecurities, those familiar foes, God became bigger. His word, his spirit, his, his, his love all became bigger. And I have to hold on to that. And I have to claim, not claim it, but I have to run into it. You know, I have to run into that every day. So. Oh, you would love the mountains here. We have so many mountains to climb. So, yeah, if you come to Phoenix, then um, we'll have to go hiking together. Yes, I, I, want, I, want, I want to see that Grand Canyon. I want to come to Phoenix. I want to, I, you know, I am a New Englander, but it's cold all the time here. But I hear that you and you guys leave for the summer and go back in the winter. We leave for the winter to warm places. It's so hot in Phoenix in the summer. Yeah, we're not snowbirds. We're here all year. But um, this past year, it was, um, now we get to 110 every year. That's that's normal. It gets to 120 here every summer. But this year, it was 55 days of 110 degrees, wow. which um, that killed all of my all my plants and uh, two of my trees. So, wow. yeah. Wow. 
It's 70 it's, degrees it's, outside now, but in the summertime, it's it's brutal. Wow. I did so don't, don't come in the summer. Don't come, <laughs> come in the winter. Okay. I uh, I did get to do a mission trip to Juarez, Mexico, which is obviously south of you guys and a little east. But at the same time, I got a touch of hot weather. And I have done a lot of missions trips to Central America and the Caribbean. But they do have a different climate because of the sea and the water. So it's not that dry heat. It's um, definitely that that uh, more moist, moistful heat. Yeah, I think you'll do fine. <laughs> like I said, I, I look forward to it. I look forward to it. We were just in Israel in uh, November, at, um, November 2019. And it was, it was 85 degrees in Jerusalem and I roasted. I had such a hard time because they have the, the elevation was different and the humidity from the um, from the sea. Yeah, I don't know if you've been to Israel, but I have not. I have not. Another another bucket some, list, if you would. Oh, all those things. Yeah, I, I long yes, to go. Yes, definitely and... recommend that for sure. Thank you. Um, Thank you. so yeah. We definitely love to travel. Um, oh, so. my wife and I, we love to travel. <laughs> you know, we we have four children. So right now our kids are in the ages of 15 to 7. So we are right in the midst of it. You know, we're, we're mom and dad taxi and, and we homeschool. So my wife is going 100 miles an hour all the time. Pastor wife, homeschool mom, and she's taking care of me. So, I mean, this is... God bless her. She, she is... If there's a <laughs> if there is a hero in this story, it's my wife. So we're blessed. So your by your her. your wife's a, a homeschooler. Um, you had said in your story that you had dyslexia growing up. Um, I do. What was that like? Well, you know, I think that I still have it. Uh, oh. God hasn't hasn't healed me from it. So what happens is, is I tell people when the way I was raised. I survived my childhood. I wasn't raised. You know, I didn't have parents that, that looked out for me. I didn't have somebody who wanted to govern my experiences or, or was an advocate for me. So I, I really just kind of survived my childhood. And one of the casualties of that was my education. Uh, it was the early 70s. So I think there was a lot going on with sight reading and some different kind of philosophies of teaching. So here I was in a broken home with a learning disability. I was being bullied at school because of the way I felt about myself. And, you know, so, so yeah, reading has always been a chore for me. It's, it still is today. Uh, mm -hmm. It still is a chore today. But again, the Lord, he helps and he, he brings me through and he gave me a brilliant wife. Uh, she is a, a teacher by education uh, and my children love to read. My son will walk into walls. He reads books this thick. I mean, and that's, uh, I remember holding him the moment he was born, praying, Lord, give him a, give him a, uh, just a heart for reading. And he does. I mean, my son, my son, 15 says, dad, can we go to the library? He just, you know, I he's, love the library. <laughs> oh he, yeah. He, he, we're friends with the librarian. They, they use them if they need a, somebody to help him out, move books. And he gets, they call him. So, so, you know, but yes, reading has always been a chore. And I believe it or not, I'm in the midst of writing a book. You know, God Oh, I was is, just going to ask that if you had a book out or not. Well, we uh, don't have one yet. We are just started to speak to a publisher, a self-publisher, you know, a self-publishing mm -hmm. company. Uh, so we're definitely in conversations. We have written, just kind of let it pour out of me. It's been there for 50 years. So just kind of poured out and uh, now we've kind of put it in front of people who really know what they're doing i tell everybody i wrote it my ways i handed it to my wife and she interpreted it and made it legible and uh, we have mm -hmm. some local friends who have done some basic editing so they're kind of editing for us and now we're sending it to the publisher who knows how to edit in a professional way so polish polish and spit right yeah that's right um, so so, you know, the Lord told me years ago uh, that this testimony would be written down. I remember I chuckled when he told me that because I said, Lord, I, I can barely read or write. And I remember saying to the Lord, 
Lord, if you want this written down, what am I going to call it? And he said, you'll call it Forgiving the Nightmare. So that's why the name of the ministry, the name of the book, the name of the website is called Forgiving the Nightmare. I think everybody has a nightmare, uh, regardless oh, yeah. of how one came. In. You know, your, yours and I came in by probably hands of other people. But sometimes nightmares come in by all different ways. Loss, regrets, uh, pains, hurts. And we all have to kind of say, Lord, how do we, how do we go through that? And I know as Christians, we want it instant. You know, we want to stand on the word. We want to claim it. We want to say, Lord, give it to me. But I think sometimes we have to uh, go through the process. I think of Jacob and how he wrestled with God or he wrestled with the angel. And they wrestled all night long. And, and God, the angel, touched his hip. And then he said, what do you want? And Jacob said, I want a new name. And he became Israel promise mm -hmm. so he left deceiver as you know and he became israel promise and i think sometimes in that journey of forgiveness as much as christians and people we want it and we, we want it so true and so earnestly but sometimes we have to wrestle we have to wrestle with the past we have to wrestle with ourselves we have to wrestle with the fears and, and wrestling doesn't make make us bad doesn't make us sinners doesn't mean god has left us I think God's working mm -hmm. with us through the process. As a pastor, I've seen so many people who are unwilling to go through the process and they get stuck. They get stuck in the cycle and the, the hurts and the pains of life just kind of build up on them. And I know God wants to set them free. But again, it you have to learn to die to self, crucify the old man, you know, tame the tongue. And it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard, especially when yes. everything in the world Especially when everything in the world tells you you're okay to have that. It's okay for you to hate. It's okay for you to be angry. It's okay for you to. But God says for us to let him go first. Let him lead us and guide us. If we forgive those who trespass against us, he will be faithful and just to forgive us. And that scripture, boy, haunted me for a long time. Because I said, Lord, I'm not ready to forgive. I want to. No. I'm sorry. I'm preaching. No, you're awesome. I I'm enjoying this. Um, I'm curious how you um, how you read your Bible. Do you do you use an audio Bible or do you um, use an actual written Bible? Well, I do right a written now? Bible. I, I I like the ESV. I like the NIV. I like the you know. So I I like those verses. I do read it. Um, I do listen to audio at times. What happened was is about twenty. I was in my early twenties. And a woman at church asked me to read the Christmas story out of Luke in front of the mm -hmm. youth group. Now, when I say youth group, we had about 100 youth in our youth group, maybe even wow. 150. It was a large youth group. And she was the kind of woman who would not take no for, the, for an answer. You know, the church lady. Yeah, I think every church has <laughs> one of those. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, she, I, you know, I tried to give her every excuse in the book. You know, I lost my glasses. Uh, I was too embarrassed to say that I couldn't read. So I got up in front of the youth group and I read out of Luke chapter two and I stumbled over my words and I read slowly and I read broken up. And people were very kind to me that day, the youth pastor and the youth group. They were not cruel. And after service, that woman came back to me and said that, she homeschooled her children, and she would like to homeschool me if I'd want to. Now I was, I was, I was a grown up. I was 23, and I went back to her house, and there I sat with her six-year-old, five-year-old, as she was teaching her five-year-old, six-year-old how to read. She was also teaching me phonics. I never learned phonics. I tell everybody when I learned T I O N and shun and not Tion. It changed my life. Well, so unbeknownst to me, unbeknownst to me, that church lady had an older daughter, and that older daughter watched me, uh, watched me struggle over my words, watched me go to the house and sit with her five-year-old sister and learn A E I O U and learn the rules of vowels and phonics. Well, years later, that older daughter would become my wife. Oh. Uh, <laughs> So, yep. So, you know, she told me that she fell in love with me. 
and she watched me there. And uh, so that that's a little bit of our love story, and uh, that's a little bit of it. But yeah, she watched me from afar, and and now today we have four kids together, and she still helps me read. So I do read. Wow. I, I'm a much stronger reader than I ever was. Uh, so mm-hmm. I, I can read a much better better than I could then. Well, I certainly can see, um, looking back, that you had so many people in your corner to that God sent to help you, and what a blessing. Um, now, did you go to college? I did. I did. The, I, I graduated from what's now called North Point, uh, North Point Bible College. At the time, it was called Zion Bible College. It, it was in Barrington, Rhode Island. It was a very focused school for ministry only. Uh, so I did go there. I didn't want to go there. I'm a New Englander. I knew about the school. It was in my backyard. I wanted to go to Southeastern, to Florida. I wanted to mm-hmm. go to uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and go to Valley Forge. Uh, those doors were not open to me. I remember saying to the Lord, I'm done, Lord. I've tried. Everybody's rejecting me because of my education. And he said, go to Zion. I went in and I met with the dean of students. In that meeting, the dean of students said to me, Mark, do you have a call? I said, yes, I believe I do have a call. He got up from his desk and he went to a big picture window. A woman was walking in front of his picture window and he tapped on the window and he called this woman in. As she came into his office, he introduced me to a woman named Jan Kruger. He let me know that Jan was led by God to go to school, to go to Zion the week earlier than me to start a learning center. And Jan and I, I became our first student in the learning center. And we worked hard. The first year, most of my uh, classes were uncredited because I had to learn how to be a student. I didn't know what a syllabi was. I didn't know how to take tests. Uh, We sat in that learning center. I cried, I complained. She was Mm -hmm. a mom. She hugged me sometimes. And she told me to, to suck it up sometimes. And that was the best <laughs> advice I could get. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I, am, I have graduated from uh, Zion. I'm a proud graduate of Zion Bible College, and I'm, and I'm ordained with the Assembly of God. So when did you get called into the ministry? I mean, well, you know, pretty much after it was about my 17th year, 16 years old, I I got saved and 17 years old. I was at a youth con- youth convention. And I pretty much felt like the Lord called me then. Now I ran from that call for a long time because of my insecurities, my fears, my inabilities. See, when I walked into the room, I always felt like I was junk, like I was dirt, like I could offer nobody nothing. And I was, no. you know, I, that's how I felt about myself. So who would let me be their pastor? What do I have to offer? I can barely read. I you know, I'm, uh, look what happened to me. So for many years, I wrestled with it. And about 25 years old, 24, 25 years old, I had a brand new truck, a little S10 pickup truck. They called it Bernie because it was purple. Uh, and I remember <laughs> I was listening to Petra. Remember Petra? I love and, Petra. <laughs> and I was, I was listening to Petra from the 70s, not, not the yeah. 90s Petra. I was listening to and I remember I was listening to Petra and the Holy Spirit filled the cab of that car and that truck. I had to pull over. I was on Old Post Road. I'll never forget tears coming down my face. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, Mark, choose this day whom you will serve. I've called you and I will equip you. And I said, God, I want you. And I, and that's when the journey of visiting colleges and I wish I could tell you it was all roses and cherries after that it wasn't that's, <laughs> you know there's still a lot of growing up and a lot of overcoming and a lot of dying to self and and there still is there still is you know there still is so, so yeah that's how I got called and I went to that school and they loved me they were honest to me and so I am very proud of being an alumni of North Point Bible College Formerly Zion Bible College or ZBI when I was there, Zion Bible Institute. ZBI. 
You sound like you had a lot in, in common with Moses with his speech impediment. He was, you know, a, you know, um, exiled to be a, a, a goat and a sheep herder, you know. <laughs> They're not going to listen to me, Lord, you know. <laughs> did you feel like that? <laughs> oh, sure. I, I sure did. I, I, you know, like I said, I, for most of my life, I felt like, what can I, what can I offer? So what I did is I put a facade, I, I put a facade on myself or I, I, I lived up to the role that I thought people wanted from me or a role to, to find acceptance or protection. So if I had to be the clown, I was the clown. If I had to be the fool, I was the fool. If I had to be the weak, I was the weak because I felt those things about me. Recently in this weight loss journey and this forgiving, God has given me confidence. And I say that with with much humility, because I know it's not my confidence, it's confidence in him. But I've never had confidence before. I feel like it's a, I feel like a carpenter with a new tool. I feel like a, a, you know, a businessman with a new suit. That I've never had confidence before. Now, again, it's not confidence in what I have, uh, because right. I'm, still, I'm still weak. But it's a confidence going, my Abba Father makes a way for me. My Abba Father heals me and and it goes before me. So it's, it's a kind of a new season for me to be confident and say, you know what? I can live a healthy life. People ask me why I lost the weight. And I remember I was reading the scripture, and you're probably familiar with it, is when the Pharisee comes to the Lord, or it says to him, Lord, how does one enter the kingdom of heaven? And the Lord says, well, what is written? And he says, Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your spirit. And love your neighbor as yourself. I've read that a million times. I've preached on it. I've, I've studied it. One day I was reading it and the Lord said to me, Mark, you don't love yourself. So how can you love your neighbor? And, mm -hmm. and I said, what? He said, Lord, I know you love me, Mark, but you don't love your neighbor. And you don't love yourself, so you can't love your neighbor. And I realized because I didn't love myself, I wasn't taking care of myself. I love my children. Mm -hmm. I love my wife. I want to take care of them. They don't need me. My wife can, but I want to, I want to do things for, her. I want to take care of them. I want to help them be better and stronger and smarter and wiser and love the Lord. And I realized I didn't love myself. So the weight loss journey, forgiving the nightmare, forgiving my mom, forgiving the abusers, forgiving those who, who betrayed me as a child, helped me begin to love myself. Again, no visions of grandeur. I'm still a, just a normal guy saved by grace. Uh, you know, I, I still put my big foot in my mouth. You know, I, my wife can come in and tell you all the stories. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I started to love myself. And well, it sounds like um, you found your self-worth in the Lord Jesus because Jesus sees you as his child and you are a child of God and that's where your worth is. So it sounds like your healing journey brought you to that place. Yeah. It's not right. self-confidence like the world says it is. It's right. how God sees you. You're precious and you're Amen. loved Amen. and you're valuable. He Amen. died for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're going to get me going now. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that's exactly. what, you know, and I want others to experience this. You know, I, my whole ministry, I've been surrounded by hurting people and hurting churches. I've worked with people that have had major traumas in their life. Not that I ever sought it. I can I think the Lord just led me to it. Uh, and as I've worked with people, people say that I've been able to bring comfort. I'm easy to talk to. I thought, well, okay, Lord. And and I want people to find that freedom that I have. I understand being shackled to pain in the past. I, under I understand allowing those things to form the way you think about and believe about yourself. And never truly being set free. Waking up with that numbing feeling of brokenness. All the time. All the time. Just constantly. But God truly set me free. He set me free, and because he set me free, I am nobody special. And being a pastor, I see so many people that have a form of this. They don't, they haven't gone through it. So they're still living with a confession in Christ, but still the hurts of the past. Mm -hmm. 
blame them. I don't, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not taking the log out of my own eye before I take the twig from their eye. But I'm saying the freedom that God has for his people. Uh, and again, do we still stumble? Yeah, do we still need refining? Sure. Are we still the clay and he's still the potter? Of course. But there's a freedom that we find. And as a pastor, I've just met so many people who will say, Pastor, I'm, I'm healed. I'm, I'm delivered. And you realize it's, it's, it's only an inch deep. It's, you know, as soon as they get tested, as soon as they get, get bothered, it just spills out. It pulls out of them in, in a defense or in, in a rejection or in a way they, they have a self view of the world or of themselves. Now, God can set us free. God can set us free. So uh, what's the difference between being a victim and being victorious? Hallelujah. Well, in my, my humble opinion, a victim is somebody who always sees themselves broken, sees themselves in a way that, that, um, that allows them to stay in their victimhood. For a long time, my victimhood became my identity. I remember one day when the Lord brought me to the altar and he said those words to me. He said, Mark, I want you to give this up. And I literally said in an audible voice, Lord, if I'm not a victim, then what am I? Because all mm. I knew was the, the role of being a victim. Oh, my victimhood was good. I could manipulate with it. I could win every argument with it. Oh, when I was 16 years old, my mom, who was a single mom with not much money, uh, she bought me a car. I had a phone in my room. I had cable in my TV, on my own TV. She made me breakfast in bed. Why? She owed that to me. Why? Because I was a victim. And I got to see how I could win every argument. At school, I could put my head down. And people didn't, you know what? I could lift up my head and go, well, who here else was molested? I was, and no one would say anything. And the Lord rebuked me at that. and hmm. said, that, yeah, that's what victims do. At least that's what I did. He said, I want to make you victorious. And I remember him saying, me saying to the Lord, if I'm not a victim, what am I? And he said, you're victorious in me. I had to learn what it meant to be victorious. Amen. You know? I had to learn to let that facade go, let that personality go, let that old man die, and let the new man of Christ rise up inside of me. That is awesome. I just, I just love that. I've never heard anybody describe it like that. Now, I prefer the, the, the word survivor instead of victim, but I think you took it up another notch. We are, we are victorious in the Lord. Well, in my victimhood, you know, as much as I was, I was a victim, but I used it for my own gain, which mm. made me just as not guilty of what happened to me, but made me not a healthy, not a healthy place. It put me in a right. But it's all I knew. You know, I could abuse, I not abuse, but I could manipulate. Say no to me. Uh, you know, my mm. I could win the argument. Right, I was the guy. I was the guy, you know, who else here was stabbed and burnt and abused? I can show you my scars where they stabbed me. I can show you the bur burn marks. I was prostituted for other men to abuse me. Boy, you know, I could really win the, win the argument. But that was wrong. Yeah. It was wrong. It was wrong to put that on my mother. It was wrong to put that on my family. It was wrong to put that on others. And the Lord had to rebuke me. And, uh, wow. and he did because he loves. He rebukes the ones he loves. So he rebukes. I just so appreciate your raw and honest um, telling of your story because you know you've heard stories where they they just they just put the you know the fluff or they put the stuff that's gonna you know bring up the the ratings or whatever. But um, you really you know, kept it real. And, um, you know, I think as a pastor, you would, you, you're a great pastor because people see that you're, you're a real person. You're, you're not some fake up there that can't relate to your, your congregation's problems. You know, Do you feel that way? Oh, definitely. You know, my congregation, as you know, like we talked earlier, I wrestled with dyslexia and every once in a while, I'll stumble over a word while I'm reading the Bible and in front of my congregation. And, 
And that really bothered me for a long time. My Lord, I'm a pastor. How can I not read this with, with poetic real? But, you know, I'm just who I am. And now when I stumble over a word, my congregation yells it up to me. So I'll be on the Aww. platform and, you know, what? they'll see me stumbling and, and, you know, they'll yell it up to me. And it's become just a term of endearment. It's not been one of rejection or shame. You know, and I say, you know what, I'm doing that just to make sure you're in the Bible. That's what I tell them. But I'll be reading the scripture and, it, and my dyslexia will kick in or or the word will be all scrambled. And, and they're the kind voices. Oh, pastor, that's, that means this. And, and it's kind of a nice interaction. I tell people the church I pastor is a real church with real people serving a real God. So wow. if you're a fancy fluff church, don't come to us because, you know, we're real, and we, we we cry together, we do life together, um, we step on each other's toes. We don't always agree, but we always love God. So, I'm the mm, pastor that is so of awesome. Of Skyline, pastor of Christian Assembly of Skyline. That's right. I, I didn't I didn't announce your church name. No. Um, I wanted to ask you to tell another story about. Uh, you said that you met your birth father at one point. What happened during that reunion? Well, I was 45 years old, and I wanted to reach out. I wanted to know. I tell people, my birth father and I met at the right place in life. I think if I would have met him younger, I would have still been angry, the rejected mm. child. But I was 45. I was the father of four. I've made my own mistakes, my own problems. I learned to mature a little bit. And to be really frank, my father's wife passed on. So he was more ready to meet me. So his wife that he had the affair on to sire me, if you would, she passed. So he was more open to meet me. And uh, I just didn't meet him, but the whole family met him together. We met in a wow. restaurant. We met in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And the family came in and the kids instantly started to call him grandpa. I thought, I don't know if I'm okay with that. I don't know if I'm <laughs> received it and he never rejected it. And we got to have so the last few years of life. We just lost him. I, I had him for about four years. It wasn't warm and fuzzy, daddy and son, but it was something. We had a relationship. We'd talk about sports. We'd talk about life. He was a snowbird from Massachusetts to Florida, and he just kind of let me know. So I'm very thankful for the four years I had. Again, it wasn't, hey, buddy, I'm proud of you kind of moment. But I got to find out a little bit about who my dad was and who some of my relatives are on my father's side. I got to learn about some of the health conditions of, of my father. And, you know, he said mm. he was pretty, he made it to 84. He liked to drink and he liked ladies. So, you know, I, mm. but, yeah, I like Jesus. So, I, you know, I like one lady. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, sometimes time heals all wounds. Um, well, it was that's an right incredible story. Life. I tell right. people it was the right time. I, again, if I would have met him at 25, I would have been angry. I would have said, you know, why did you abandon me? 45 was a good time because, you know what, by that time, I, I stepped in enough life of my own to to not to be slow to judge, you know. So, well, God um, does have the perfect timing. Um, I, you know, I haven't spoken much about my story at all on here, but um, my husband and I talk about, boy, I wish that we had met, you know, a long time ago, you know, and skipped all the pain because we were, we were both um, victims of abuse from our previous spouses. I'm sorry. And, um, but we, we thought about it and we, we thought, um, you know, we were different people than if, if we met at that time, I don't think I would have been interested in you and you wouldn't have been interested in me. And, um, I think that God brought us together at this time of our life. Now we've been married 11 years. Congratulations. Um, thank you. So, um, God brought us together at our time of life, because that was the perfect time. And, sure. you know, we're best friends. We, we never even have had a real fight. We wow. disagree, of course. Now, you should write a book we, about that. 
Okay, we've that's... never had like a real fight. We've, I mean, we disagree and and um, get on each other's nerves, but the Lord well, has just normal. just blessed Amen. us. Amen. Yeah, we're definitely normal, um, especially during this pandemic. It's like you learn about your your spouse when you're stuck with them twenty four seven, right? That's true. That's um, true. Yeah, we had to make some adjustments, um, but but we're doing fine. Amen. And um, we still love each other. <laughs> You know, and, and that it's great that you're talking about times of life, you know, for such a time as this, you know, and and I think for me, the Lord spoke to me years ago about forgiving the nightmare ministry. He actually spoke to me when I was in college about this. I didn't know it was going to uh, blossom or what it was going to look like. But he spoke to me years ago about writing it down. And it was always inside me. And I kept saying my wife knew about it. And we would always think, How's, what's the Lord going to do with this? Is it just inside me to guide me through life? Is it, is it more for others? Is it, Lord, how's it, how's it going to blossom, if you would, manifest? And we lost my mom. And I have to tell you that not immediately, but pretty quick after losing my mom, I felt like this ministry could just launch. And it has launched. God has brought brought uh, brought a web designer into our life he's brought some um, producers into our life to help me tell the story we're talking with a, an editor and a publisher and all this has happened fairly quickly and i think lord why now and i think to be honest with you and this is just my opinion I, I don't know if i have chapter and verse to back this up but my mom was so embarrassed she was so full of shame because of my my upbringing, every time for the last 20 years of my life, every time me and my mom were alone together, she would just apologize. And I don't just mean say sorry. She would grovel and I would say, mom, I forgive you. I forgive you. Marky, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And, and if my mom knew that I was speaking to podcasts or writing a book or, or having a, she would have been so so embarrassed, so she may, you know, it would have just troubled her so much. So I think out of the grace of God, and again, don't have chapter and verse, but I think upon her passing, released me to be able to share this story, to be able to bring others into it. I just think God was being merciful to my mom uh, on her journey. And and again, it was almost pretty instant after her uh, her own passing that, I remember being on the treadmill one morning and the Lord just kind of just impressing upon me the giving the nightmare. Remember those words I spoke to you. This is where it's going to take place. And since then, we've, we've made a couple of videos. Uh, we've launched a website. I'm talking to wonderful people like yourself and <laughs> just trying to get, try to get the story out of forgiving the nightmare and trying to say to people, whatever that nightmare was, was it physical and sexual abuse like mine? Was it a tragedy in your life? Is it regrets? Is it fears? Is it the loss of a child or a loved one? Whatever that pain is, it's your nightmare. I want you to know that God can help you forgive it and overcome it and break the shackles so we don't have to be the man or the person the, the hurt tried to make us. We no longer have to be Jacob, but we can become Israel. Wow, I think your mom would be. Amen. Your mom, your mom would be so proud of you, and I think that Thank if you. Um, the Lord's probably told her, you know, the good things that have come out of a terrible situation. You know, she said she had. You said she had some shame. Oh. Um, I think if she was looking down at you now, that 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 shame would be gone. That shame is no longer there. Look, look how, look how God's using my son, my my wonderful son, to spread the gospel and to help people. And so, well, you know, I'm you. so thankful thank for you. you, brother. Thank you for saying those words, sister. It's very kind of you. I used to say to my mom, even up to her last days, I would say, "Mom, who's your favorite?" And she would say, <laughs> "I love you all, all the same." And I'd say, Mom, stop lying to my siblings. So, uh, you know, that's, but, <laughs> but she, you know, I'm the youngest of three. 
Um, my older brother and my older sister never made me feel like a, a step or a half brother. Uh, we just mm. kind of always lived in the same house. We got real family problems and we we have sibling, sibling problems, just life, but they've yeah. never left, never met me felt, never let me feel like I was less than, um, even to today. So I'm very thankful That's for my awesome. oldest sister, who is, uh, who is a second mom to me. Um, my oldest sister, uh, she, uh, she is my second mom and I'm thankful for her. So, Wow. Well, we just had just a great time tonight. Um, uh, when your book comes out, you know, please contact me. I would love to have you on the show again to promote your book because um, obviously you, your story is so powerful and we Thank want you. to get it out to as many people as we can. So um, tell uh, the folks how to connect with you. Well, the best way to connect with me is at forgivingthenightmare.com forgivingthenightmare.com, forgivingthenightmare.com is the best way to connect with me. If you go there, you'll find an email. It's called mark at forgivingthenightmare.com. That comes directly to me right on my phone. So that's the best way to connect with me. Uh, also, you can go to our Facebook page called uh, Forgiving the Nightmare, uh, Forgiving the Nightmare Facebook page. I try to put up uh, pictures and little devotions there and stories there. So that's the two best ways through Facebook at Forgiving the Nightmare and at ForgivingTheNightmare.com. Those are the best ways to connect with me. And oh, I hope to get to so Arizona much. someday. I hope to get out you there have an you. open invitation. Wow. I will be a tour guide for you. I know Arizona, like the back of my hand. I've lived here since I was 10. So Wow, wow. <laughs> Now my children can hear you in the background, so they're going to be pretty excited about that invitation. There's so much stuff for 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 their age group as well, so um, we will hook you hook you guys up. Um, so thanks for being patient with the tech stuff, and I'm glad we pushed through and didn't let the devil get Amen. the victory tonight. We. We found a way to get you on here. May I pray for you as we close? Oh, yes, okay? please. Thank you. Please sure. do. Father God, we just come to you tonight and we thank you again for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that he gave to us upon the cross, Lord. We pay the price we could not pray, Lord. And we thank you for the gift of life and life more abundant, Lord. And we thank you for the promises that says in this life there will be many troubles, but fear not because you are with us always. And Lord, tonight I pray for my sister. Father, I thank you that you're using her, Lord, to spread the gospel, to share hope, to be a light in a dark place. But Father, now I pray that you come beside her. Father, as she's shared that she's lost her brother this week, Lord, and I pray you comfort her. Lord, you said you had to go so the comforter could come. I pray the comfort of the Holy Spirit will come beside my sister and be with her and her family as they grieve their loved one, their family member, their friend, Lord. So, Lord, I pray peace upon my sister. I pray, Lord, that you use her, continue to bless her. I thank you for the testimony of her and her husband, 11 years that you brought together for such a time as this. I pray, Lord God, that they grow closer to you so they can grow closer to each other. And, Lord, we thank you tonight that, Lord, we're no longer Jacob, that you've made us Israel. Father, no longer do we have to be shaped by our past, but now we can hold on to the promises. Lord, no longer do we have to be shackled by somebody else's abuse, but we can be set free by your word. So, Lord, I pray that you fill us, you lead us, and may we be the light. And may we be the salt, and may we lift up your name. We pray for a unity across our nation. We pray for a healing across our land. And we pray, Lord, for a revival of your salvation to come to our, our country again. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Thank you so much, brother. God bless, sister. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care Bye. of yourself. Bye now. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Wounds of the Faithful podcast. If this episode has been helpful to you, please hit the subscribe button and tell a friend. You can connect with us at dswministries.org, where you'll find our blog along with our Facebook, Twitter, 
and our YouTube channel links. Hope to see you next week.